I'm Aaron Sagers, and this is Talking Strange. Hello, all spooky nerds, and welcome to Talking Strange, a paranormal pop culture show with the Den of Geek Network. I'm your host, journalist, author, researcher of weird things, Aaron Sagers. You can also catch me on 28 Days Haunted on Netflix and Paranormal Caught on Camera, now airing its sixth season on Travel Channel and the Max streaming service and Discovery+. Plus. Now, my guest today is someone I've known for a long time and then kind of have gotten to know again through this weird job mm-hmm. of ours. And she is a psychic medium who has been seen on travel channels, the Holzer Files and Ghosts of Devil's Perch, a whole bunch of travel channel shows such as Fright Club and Conjuring Kesha. And she's been on Shock Docs and all over the place. She, she's like the busiest woman in paranormal TV, I think. <laughs> and now she can be seen on the latest episodes of the dead files that's right the dead files and picking up where this season left off at the end of july cindy Keza joins former nypd homicide detective steve deshavi as lead investigator for seven all new episodes the two two will team up to help solve more incidents of devastating paranormal activity for beleaguered homeowners and that's coming out on thursday september 7th at 10 p.m. ET on Travel Channel, and I believe same day on Max. So, Cindy Keza. Cindy, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Aaron. I'm excited to be chatting with you. I know we're always trying to set something up, and you are a busy woman. You travel around a lot, and also you're just filming constantly, it seems like. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, no, like filming Travel Channel stuff and working on my passion project and all that jazz, totally. Yeah. It's um so well it's good to see it's good to see you uh virtually, even though we did recently catch up with each other on in Alaska of all places. We live on this you know, not too far from one another, and yet it took us going to the last frontier in Alaska to True. actually see each other and chat. I know, it's crazy. I know you gotta come hang out sometime. Waiting. I know. Well, I guess before we dig into the, all the other the the good stuff. How was that Alaskan cruise for you? It was part of Amy Bruni's Strange Escapes event, and we were there with a bunch of supporters, attendees, and just going through this last frontier. Were any notable moments for you on that cruise? I don't know if you've been up there before. No, it was my first time in Alaska. So, I mean, look, like it was so fun. Um, I had so much fun like hanging out with the people that came to the cruise in support of us. And uh, But I will say Glacier Bay. I mean, that was magnificent, is magnificent. Yeah, it was one of these locations for those out there that don't know. It's the cruise ship would stop at places like Juneau and Ketchikan and Skagway. But Glacier Bay National Park, that's an area that you can really only access if you have your own helicopter, pretty much, or you're on a cruise ship. It's it doesn't seem like it's easy to get to in your cruising through this just natural splendor seeing giant glaciers uh hence the catchy name and uh, sea lions and whales and I don't know, what all did you see any wildlife while you're out there yeah i mean we saw uh whales and sea lions wait we saw uh, orcas did you see the orcas i saw tails so this is, uh, I don't know if I want to tell this story, because what if somebody's listening that, okay, so well, I'll tell you, uh, it's really funny because um, Andrea, you know, you were there with Andrea, love her so much, but she Andrea was like, Perrin. oh my God, you know, the orcas and the the uh, humpbacks are playing together. And then we look out and there's all these humpbacks and then you see the orcas and they're all kind of circling around. And we were like, oh, it's so magical, this magical moment. And then we found out later that it was actually the orcas hunting the baby uh, humpback. Like they like kill them. And so we thought we were seeing this beautiful, magical moment with these whales playing together. And then our dreams were crushed by mother nature, but it was like, it was so crazy. But at least it's mother nature being mother nature, (laughs) as opposed to humans being involved in, in the bad scene. You know, it's like, 
I, you know, I always enjoyed nature documentaries. I still enjoy nature documentaries. And of course, there's a little bit of that thrill when there is this predator prey situation. Yes, you feel bad for the prey, but it's nature being mother nature. But that's still no, better. I know. Than, yeah, it's just so because because Andrea was like, oh, my God, it's the most beautiful thing. And we were all like, this is magnificent. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, when we found out what was really happening. I was like, I don't have the heart to tell her. This is like, I can't ruin that moment for her. <laughs> don't listen to this, Andrea. <laughs> Plug your ears. Well, I'll make certain they were just it. playing. <laughs> I'll let Andrea know this is one episode of the show that she should she should skip over. <laughs> oh, I love her. Yeah. Well, you know, with you, I know your intuitive abilities really began when you were a child, right around age 10 seems to be the moment that they kind of kicked off, right? Yeah, well, you know, I always tell people like it's the first experience that I can remember having seen somebody who had died. But at that time, I didn't know what was happening, right? I was like, this is weird. This girl that died in my elementary school who I knew, uh, you know, was standing directly by my bed, but she's dead. And it was like really scary. But I grew up, you know, in a family of Catholics, um, born again, Christians, like we don't talk about that stuff. We didn't talk about it, you know. Um, and I, I just didn't understand until I like, figured out oh I'm a psychic medium I uh, it, that that's what what had happened but it was one of those experiences where you know I never forgot it it was a she was a full body apparition standing there you know and and then you know I pulled the covers over my head I pulled them back and she was still standing there so that was my first memorable encounter but it took me years to figure out what was going on. But even in like, you know, elementary school and high school and whatever, I was having premonitions. I knew when things were going to happen before they did, uh, which is psychic. I could read people very well. I could sense spirits. I always had this feeling something or somebody was around, uh, but I didn't have an outlet for it, which is super common. You know, people talk about that all the time, like, like, especially kids. And so it was when I was 19, I met my first mentor. Her name was Bonnie. She passed away in 2011. Uh, she's the first person who said to me, Cindy, you're a psychic medium. And I was like, what are you talking about, lady? I was like, I thought she was nuts, you know? And uh, and then we started spending more time together. She started teaching me about metaphysics. And I still didn't quite get it. Um, and then it was like in my mid-20s, well, like 23 years old, right around that time, that I started to recognize like oh my gosh like I am a psychic medium and I'll tell you what happened at 23 I quit drinking alcohol so I was like so and this is part of my story it's like you know I was like self-medicating I think because my sensitivity was so strong and when I stopped doing that then everything just kind of hit me in the face and then I made the decision like okay I, I have to figure this out because it's not going away um, and then that began you know my my journey, like, I guess my journey began a, a long time ago, but that, that was where, uh, or when I really, you know, said, I need to start learning more about this. And I never looked back, you know, um, I consider myself a lifelong student of mediumship. Uh, so I, I want to preface anything I'm about to say, uh, in this interview with, uh, you know, you could ask me the same question in 10 years and I might have a totally different answer for you. So I am constantly growing and evolving and learning and exploring all the different possibilities and ideas. Um, but I really truly believe that like no human being can completely comprehend uh, what's going on on the other side in this dimension like we just maybe maybe if you have a near-death experience that's one way but you still have to come back into duality and talk about it in terms of duality so it's very hard for us to comprehend well, let me let me go back to that early experience again when you saw this girl from school but did she communicate a message to you she was just staring at me. She was standing there and staring at me. So this happens a lot to people when they see spirits. So they're like, I saw my dad, but he wasn't saying anything. He was just staring at me, right? So I didn't understand spirit communication at the time. And a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't understand how the spirit world communicates. We are fed this idea that the communication has to be like, I'm talking to you, that this is the the connection, Right. So spirits communicate in a lot of different ways. And a lot of times you might see a spirit, but then you're like, well, I don't hear anything. And the next question I would ask is, well, what do you feel? Or what do you just know? 
because they're all the and stop me if I go on tangents a lot so you can stop me but I like to like educate people about how this works because I, I describe it like playing Pictionary charades and telephone all at the same time so I might have one spirit that uh gives me the name through hearing and it's generally not external auditory it's like if you were to sing the words to your favorite song in your head right I might hear in my mind Tom I might feel it's a grandfather I might know that he had a heart attack and I might see that he had a truck, for example. So it can feel like all these different pieces of a puzzle are hitting you. And then as a medium and a psychic, you have to sit there and feel into what is the story trying to tell me? What is this person trying to tell me? Um, so it's not so straightforward. I wish, I mean, I hope my mediumship gets to a place one day. This is like, dear God, let this happen where I am sitting with the spirit and the spirit is talking to me. Like I'm talking to you. That would make my life so much easier, you know? Um, but it's usually not like that. Do you think it is in that early age and maybe even now that if that may be there's some sort of, well, sensitivity on our end, on the sort of corporeal form. But do you think there's a sensitivity amongst the spirits that they know kind of who to go to and and try to communicate yes. to? Yes, 100%. And I'll tell you, this is the, I teach mediumship a lot, right? And this is what I teach my students. As mediums, we have to really do our own inner work, our deep work to understand where our limitations are and what what we're afraid of, right? So for example, if I as a medium uh, am afraid to talk to murderers and I refuse to talk to murderers, if I feel that energy, why would that spirit come to a medium who has the door closed there? Uh, why, right? So I have a lot of students that like are afraid to, to go into these stories that are tragic or difficult because they're they're afraid of the emotions it will bring up inside themselves or they're afraid to communicate it with somebody else so until uh until mediums are open uh to exploring all of it it will limit your ability or you might feel it you might sense it and totally push it away and this is the 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 issue that i see sometimes where um people will, mediums will label something demonic because it feels uncomfortable without during, doing further investigation. Just because something feels angry and aggressive does not make it demonic, mm. right? But we have to, as mediums, really do this work and figure out where are my limitations? Where am I afraid? Where, yeah, yeah. And these years between age 10-ish to 19, when you start realizing this might be what what's going on with you, was this you said that your family was very religious, not receptive to this kind of thing? It's not something you talk about. So was that a very traumatic time where you felt different and didn't really have anyone to speak to about this significant thing that you're living with? Well, look, I've always felt different. That's another uh, common thing about psychics and mediums and empaths. It's like we don't quite feel like we fit in anywhere. And it's look, it's not just us. A lot of people feel that way. But yeah, no, I mean, I didn't look. It's like I, I didn't have uh, nobody ever talked to me about spirits. So if you grew up in a family where people talk about this stuff, of course, I could have gone and said, oh, I saw this spirit. Right. But it's just more that I didn't even know what was happening. I wasn't in the kind of environment where people talked about those kinds of things. And I'll tell you, even after I, uh, you know, came out as a psychic medium, I still don't really talk to uh, certain members of my family about it. Uh, you know, the Catholic side of the family, uh, I've had aunts that were nuns. Uh, they're no longer, you know, nuns, but you know, we're nuns. I mean, we don't even talk about what I do for a living. It doesn't even, it doesn't even come up and they know what I do, you know? So it's like, in some ways I'm okay. I'd rather we not talk about it than, than have it be some sort of conflict in our family, but it's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a place we don't go. So you began training. I know you, you trained in the U S and then you also were training at the Arthur Finley school of intuitive sciences in England so people will hear that and then they'll say, what, you're going to school to be a psychic? What's, you know, what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, give, offer some clarity on that, on what, what training entailed for you. 
Yeah. So people always ask me, what do you mean you went to school to be a psychic medium? You know? Yes, I did get training. The training is super useful because again, as I was saying before, uh, it feels like Pictionary charades and telephone sometimes and learning how to navigate those pieces and sit with it and know how to get the story out for the spirit is super useful. Uh, secondly, I studied uh, all different aspects of um, things that would be under the umbrella of mediumship, including trance, um, you know, or and under psychics of trance, auras, uh, automatic writing, um, what else? I mean, scrying. I'm trying to think that like tons of things. And some of those things I'm not. I, I don't consider myself to be a deep trance medium. Um, technically, everything is a form of a uh, version of trance, but I am not like uh, Holzer Files trance, you know, like Hans Holzer's mediums. Um, but yeah, so I think that like, it's one of those things where do I think everybody's going to be a professional psychic medium? No, but I think every human being has the potential to communicate with spirits has the potential to feel psychic energies. Um, and so going and taking classes can help you understand and navigate that space but also understand the subtleties in the communication. And that's what's really important because a lot of times it's a lot more subtle uh, most of the time than what we're seeing on like The Sixth Sense. That movie's amazing, but it creates this um, kind of picture that humans have to be seeing spirits like I'm looking at you or it's not happening. And that's not true. Um, and just to, to, to add on to this, uh, something, my good friend, her name's Jennifer Schaefer. She's also a psychic medium, one of my best friends. Um, we were having a conversation once and she said, uh, you know, Cindy, like our jobs as psychic mediums are finished when nobody has to come see us anymore because everybody's having their own experiences. I'm like, exactly. But how do we, how do we do that? Is it even possible? Uh, so Teaching is like one of the things I love the most because I like to share the things that I've learned. Uh, and I've spent a lot of years and, and again, I'm still a student of mediumship, but even traveling to different cultures and religions and countries and trying to understand how, how other people communicate cross-culturally is super fascinating. You know, I've, I've spent a lot of time, as you know, in, in on the job, haunted locations, at events, things like that, much like you. And you know, I would not I, I always say people like I don't I'm not a sensitive, I'm not a psychic. But for me, you know, when I'm spending time in these locations, I kind of view it as like finding a radio station uh, on on sort of a, a backcountry road, you know, and kind of tuning in a little bit. And the more you try for me, anyhow, it seems like the more I'm able to kind of tune in and then even start trusting some of the signals within my own person body and, and that's it that's exactly it Aaron that's having an experience because the spirit world will use uh use energy to create sensations in our bodies for us to understand that they're there or you could be pick, picking up on a psychic imprint left behind right mm -hmm. like so that's the thing that is an experience that is some sort of communication with another energy uh, and when I say mediumship, uh, please, listeners, no, I do not just mean human souls. If you're into aliens, good for you. Love aliens. All that jazz. I think it's all there. There's a lot going on over there. Like, you know, we, we our consciousness is, a, is, I don't know, that's a whole other topic. But the point is, I believe there's lots of stuff going on over there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is also something that comes up in a lot of conversations for, for me, anyhow, when I, I try to. I try to tell people I think this word ghost is almost a very limited de definition when my so limited. is very expansive. So, yeah, I guess with that, I mean, you know, how would you define it? And, and what do you even think about things like other realities or the notion of other times kind of playing other kind yes. of temporal displacement, things like that? What's your notion on those? Have you seen the show The OA? Oh, 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 hey, yeah, that's the Canadian show. Oh, hey, no, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You, yeah, you I, I know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that show's cool. I mean, made me think a lot. Like, you know, here's what I'm starting to believe. Again, uh, ask me 10 years, might have a totally different answer for you. Uh, I'm starting to believe that everything is happening all at the same time, past, present, future. It's all there. It's less about going somewhere to another dimension. And it's more about shifting our awareness to another 
I don't know. It's a shift in the awareness because I think past, present, and future are happening simultaneously. I just think that it's all there. Um, can I explain that? No, it's confusing. We're in a in a dimension of dimension of duality. But here's the here's where it gets so tricky. It's like when I say dimension, I'm giving it space. I'm giving it a layer. I'm giving it a level. Uh, if everything's ha right here happening all at once, then that doesn't even make sense. So this is where we run into like our human brains have a really hard time. Like uh, we don't have the words to describe it. Um, it's super confusing, but it's like this, you know, um, people talk about past lives. They're like, oh, I was this in a past life. I was this in a past life. Okay. Um, and I believe in past lives or I believe in a connection to spirits or these energies somewhere else. But what I would go to say is, what I would rather say is, um, you know, we come into a soul, we have the soul with with everything inside of it, with with access to everything that it's ever existed and will be. Uh, my question would be, why are you remembering that past life or that soul in this moment? Because you have access to all everything with inside of yourself. Uh, so it's about co-creation and co-creating an experience in a moment, making meaning of a moment everything we access uh, in these realms in these dimensions or these spaces or whatever you want to call it uh, is showing us something about ourselves right now. Uh, and I mean that when I say paranormal investigating too, because if I go to a paranormal investigation, there's a reason that I'm able to connect with a certain spirit or a certain soul uh, in a certain way. Uh, what that spirit is showing me is showing me it for a reason, but there's something inside of me that can connect there. Uh, another medium might go in, get the same spirit and get totally different evidence. Doesn't mean either of us are wrong. See what I'm yeah. saying? Oh, for certain. I mean, it's, it, it's actually a frustration that I have with sort of the, uh, not everyone, of course, but some folks in the paranormal investigative community is that people try to put phenomena into a box, a neatly contained box and, and, we're, we're by definition talking about things that are unexplained and above current scientific explanation. So um, why would you try to put this expansive thing into a very strict set of rules when it doesn't seem to follow that? And there, you know, I don't like rules. I don't like boxes. I don't like, I mean, well, I paranormal boxes are kind of cool. Some, you know, but it's like, I, I, I don't like, um, I guess I don't like it when people come across as being so certain of something that is so uncertain. And so you're never going to hear me say ever as a medium, I know exactly uh, what happens when we die and I'm right and this and this because I, I can't say that with integrity. I mean, I, I think uh, we are limited. We can become limited by how we're socialized uh, and that will really, um, you know, inhibit uh, our ability to sense everything that's happening over there. Like when I go to Indonesia and I'm dealing with these spirits and I have mediums from a different culture telling me they're seeing things that are completely, were completely outside of my scope because I didn't have any prior understanding of what they could be until I started, you know, learning. And then I was, then I could see, do you see what I mean? It's like, it says something, but it also says something about how we show up and co-create the experience with all of these energies. Right. When you're not looking yeah. for Waldo, you may not see him, but when you're looking for him and focusing in on it, you start noticing the patterns. Exactly. But, but just on that note, and what would be an example of something within your uh, travel, specifically in Indonesia, that was not something that was within your purview that you didn't then did focus on? Right. So in 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 Indonesia, uh, majority uh, uh, of people are Muslim and Muslim uh, in the Islamic religion. There's a belief in jinn, which are creatures made of smokeless fire that exist in another realm. Now, uh, I understood, you know, I'd read, OK, they you know uh, that there's a belief in jinn, but I had never seen a gin, you know? Uh, and so then I was working with a medium who's saying that there's a gin, there's a gin. And I was like, gin, interesting. I wonder if I can tap into gin. And then, then there was an investigation I did and I was saying, oh, I'm seeing this creature that's like 
looks like it's in a tree as long as he these long dark hair and it's like weird and my friend's like that's a kunti lana that's a specific type of gin right but i didn't know that i was just describing what i was seeing and then it was a gin right they have a name for like there's all these different types of there are all these different types of gin so that's an example but what's super fascinating is at least I think it's fascinating is as going over there, uh, doing paranormal investigations with mediums from different cultures, you know, I might say I see a woman standing over there who died this way. And the, the paranormal investigator from Indonesia, who is a, a Muslim, would say, oh, yeah, I see this, this and this, but that's not a human. That's a jinn tr making making itself appear as a human. So we could see the exact same things, but we have totally different interpretation of what's happening. Mm -hmm. right yeah and i and i don't know that i've personally or that i'm aware of having an experience with the jinn but i'm very familiar with the phenomenon the belief systems surrounding it it's interesting because it has made its way to western cultures a bit but it seems there is this misconception that it's uh, interchangeable with a demon or and and it's kind of like a much bigger thing and grander. It's scope. way it's massive. There's massive. And, uh, you know, I think I'm right when I say this. Please don't quote me on this. I feel like I'm correct when I say this. The concept of jinn actually predates uh, Islamic, the Islamic religion, because they're indigenous cultures talking about the uh, jinn. But it's like more of a, connected to the elements, I think. Um, I Please don't quote me on that. But. But it's look, it's like, right, if you talk to somebody who uh, works with gin or believes in gin, it's like there are thousands and thousands of different races of these gin. It's not just one thing. It can be many things, you know, yeah. and they believe Bigfoot to gin. Aliens are gin. Everything's gin. Right. And mm. so, yeah. Well, let's let's kind of shift into the TV mode a little bit. So, you know, you train, you start becoming aware of your talents you stop drinking and then we get to the tv element like what was actually what was the very first um tv spot that you did uh holzer files i mean holzer files is the first show that i ever was you know was a part of that made it on air i had a pilot with lifetime in 2013 that did not go to series uh thank god um but it didn't i wasn't you know yeah. it's like i look back i was so bummed i'm like oh thank god i wasn't ready for tv i had too many other things going on in my life it was not the right time um, and, you know, interestingly enough, like when, you know, I never thought that I would be doing necessarily paranormal television because the the bulk of my work was touring, doing live events and bring, connecting people with their relatives who had passed away. Um, so when I was asked to do a paranormal show, I was like, oh, interesting. I don't know, like maybe. And then when I found out the concept and it was Hans Holzer and how much Hans Holzer believed in psychic mediums, I was like, yeah, count me in. That's awesome. Like I'm, I'm in. Um, and so it's funny because prior to doing Holzer Files, I hadn't done a ton of paranormal investigations, but I had a lot of tools in my tool belt, like automatic writing and psychometry and spying and all these things that I was able to show up and do it, you know? Yeah, and it's I didn't realize that Holzer was the first TV spot because I met you had to be eleven years ago or maybe, and I knew you were doing we workshops met, and everything. It was at uh through the veil in Atlanta. Right. Yeah, and that was like that. That was over ten years ago. Yeah, yeah. So when you now are established doing this. And you enter the TV realm, obviously, like you can have a skill set, then, but then bringing it to TV is a whole different thing, regardless of what the skill set is, Ooh. even if it's working on cars or baking or so when you're bringing, what was the biggest learning curve for you to bringing these talents to TV? Oh, man, it was terrifying, Aaron. Honestly, it's like I had to just the learning curve, I guess, was this. I had to just surrender and trust because if you've ever seen me work live, um, I don't know if you have. I don't think you have, actually. When I'm when I'm doing readings for people, I'll say something like, I have your dad here. I feel he died of cancer. I'm hearing this name. Do you understand? The person's either going to say yes or no. So uh, 
in paranormal normal television, there's like no validation, really. I mean, in Holzer files, uh, I might get like, yeah, go down that path or yep, we understand. But I just had to surrender and just say every single thing that I was seeing. But the other learning curve for me, too, is that um, and I say this to my students, paranormal investigation, in my opinion, as a psychic medium is way harder than doing a private reading or doing an event where you're reading for a group, because you have to remember uh, there's a lot more going on. You're trying to solve a puzzle like you have land, you have people, you have um you know, the spirits, you have what happened in the past, you have all of these elements that play a role, or maybe some of them don't, in what's, con in what's contributing to the activity. And you have to remember to touch in on those pieces. Uh, it's, it's really, um, it's super challenging and fun. And it, it keeps me on my toes. And it's like, I don't know, I really enjoy it. You know, it's, it's, yeah. It's, and you know, when you're doing TV, even if you're an expert on something like, let's say a very specific kind of research or topic, but when suddenly there's cameras on you and there's a lot of people around or people are expecting results, there can be that kind of psychological weight. It's a lot of stress. Oh, it, so stressful. And it can throw you off. It can make you suddenly like you could talk all day well, long about Star Wars, but suddenly not remember a thing about it in the moment. Now, translate that to having to be an intuitive does the pressure do the you know the the producers or a camera guy a shooter around you does that cloud your intuitive abilities at all did that was that a separate level of kind of fine tuning that you had to learn yeah sure you know um man i will tell you uh there isn't a walkthrough that i do where i'm not prior to it going, Oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. Oh gosh, I'm so nervous because you know, you, you, you're, you're on television. You're hoping you don't want to let your team down. You have no idea what's going to happen. They don't tell me anything before dead files, like or holes or files. I don't know anything, you know, it's like, you're just going in there or ghost of devil's perch either. But like, you know, you're going in uh, as a medium, like blind, and then you have cameras in your face and then you're worried about, did I say that the right way? Is what I'm saying making sense? Like, you know, and you're trying to navigate like being outside of yourself a bit and also speaking coherently enough to make sense for television. Um, yeah, it's stressful. It can be stressful. Yeah. And being hyper yeah. self-aware of like how you look oh, and like the self-consciousness. All of it. But yeah, it's a, uh, so just from the historian and research perspective, I know it's a lot and that's that's outside of intuitive skills. So have you are there have there been moments on camera for you where maybe you're not locking on to that thing when the cameras are rolling, but you get back to the hotel room at the end of the night and then it hits you get those readings or maybe even long after the camera stopped rolling, like days, weeks, months later where you lock in on something about that case from before. Yeah, that's a great question. So usually if I'm going to get a hit like that, it'll be pretty soon after because I'm really, I consider myself to be pretty good at keeping boundaries and trying to just like not be tapped into those energies all the time. Uh, I just, I try to disconnect from locations. What I do do is after a walkthrough, replay the walkthrough in my head. I'm like, oh man, oh, now I know what that means. Oh crap, I didn't interpret it right initially or whatever, right? So those things can happen. Um, I've had energies follow me from an investigation, right? Um, I mean, the reality is spirits are around us all the time anyway. But I think once you're kind of locked in and they know you or they sense your energy, then it they can. So, yeah. yeah. So as I mentioned before, you've done a lot of TV projects at this point, a lot of documentaries, um, a couple series. And now you're joining Dead Files, a a show that's been on for 15 seasons and I know Amy, Amy Allen stepped away and you're stepping into this established series what makes the dead files a different kind of project for you to work on oh my gosh um and you know I have to give Amy so much credit for 15 seasons you know these cases aren't easy they're super heavy you're dealing with people that are you know scared and upset and these locations are super intense um, she did a great job. Uh, I really have to give her a lot of credit. I mean, 15 seasons and amazing medium. Um, this show I'd say is different in the sense that 
we're going in to really to help families in need, right? So like the other shows I've done, the Colzer Files, you know, we're going in, we're investigating a location that Hans Holzer had been. It's not necessarily that the people living there are like in duress, you know? So they, they're maybe they're curious about what's going on. And then we're trying to see, is there still something happening? And sometimes there are, you know, uh, you know, the places were still haunted, usually, you know, um, but it's not that the people were like, I need to either know if I can stay here or go, right? So we're going in, um, really sitting with these families that are struggling, uh, and, and they really are, you know, and, and to, to be able to provide, hopefully provide some sort of relief to them is, is really rewarding, you know, um, truly. So it's been, like a really interesting journey, um, you know, especially on this show, diving in, sitting with these families, getting to know them and, and, and hopefully helping them. Yeah. You've, it seems like you primarily have worked with Steve Shippey, Dave Schrader, and now Steve DeChevy. How would you, and these are di very different kinds of investigators, each established in their own right, but how would you kind of compare and contrast the approaches of those guys, but also the different kind of energy and vibes that they bring to these cases. Oh, I mean, I don't know. Everybody brings their own flavor, right? Like I love working with all of them. Like Dave, like Dave is like an amazing orator, you know, like he's such a, he's so smart and knowledgeable and like knows paranormal. Like I don't think I know anybody that knows it as well as him. I mean, you maybe you do. I just haven't talked to you that much. But like the guy knows a lot, you know. Um, so to be able to like, and he has a big heart, you know. He he goes in and he uh, really cares about paranormal investigations, you know. Uh, also, Steve Shippey. I mean, I can't really separate them on that that when I talk about them because they're both like like that, you know. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's like hard to say, like, I, I think personality wise, they're different, but I enjoyed working with, with everyone that I've worked with, you know? Um, I think Steve Shippey has some really cool equipment. I like his approach and, and how he sets up his equipment. I mean, we've had some really crazy experiences. Um, but yeah, no, it's like, I, I learn from everybody that I work with, uh, to be honest with you, like I consider myself, uh, when it comes to the world of paranormal, like, definitely a, a student a student in general but like as far as like understanding uh the names of all of the different phenomena that happen I'm like Dave what you know help help me <laughs> you know like what is that you know so yeah 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 everybody definitely brings a different flair and um energy to things and now you you joined the show at the end of sort of the first part of of the season that was in July end of July and now uh, September 7th, you're coming back. Uh, and this is kind of the premiere episode for this next batch. And the title of this episode is The Butcher. And in it, the synopsis that mm. I've been provided is Donalyn has dealt with the paranormal most of her life, but nothing has felt ever felt threatening until her adult daughter, Reagan, moves back in. Now in fear for her family's safety and her life, Donalyn reaches out to Steve and Cindy for answers to the activity tearing her family apart. And after their separate investigations, Steve and Cindy revealed their terrifying findings, hoping to provide answers to the onslaught of dangerous activity and a path forward for Donalyn. So that's a that's a lot. That's a mouthful. So break it down. Yeah. Tease out a little bit more about what's happening in this season premiere on September 7th. It's funny because I didn't even know that that was the premiere episode, but I'm glad that it, I'm like, oh, it's that one. Man, that case, um, super interesting. I'm not sure, like, I haven't seen, I haven't even seen it yet, so I'm not sure what to say because um, uh, I don't want to give a lot of it away, right? But what I'll say is, uh, man, it was, it was an episode where I got in there and I couldn't believe, like, it was hard to believe what I was experiencing. I was like, can I really say the butcher? Like, what is this is this is scary. And then the other part was to really feel into who is who is participating in this activity, because, you know, a lot of times it's not the person who's calling the dead files. They might think that they're the one participating, but it's actually somebody who might not know that they have an ability that they have. 
Uh, a lot of times, you know, we find that people, you know, are super open, they don't realize it, they're pushing it away. But in that space, it's actually creating a, an energy, you know, and, and so I don't know how much to say. Uh, interesting case, super freaky. Like it was a scary one for sure. Well, on that note, when you're working with clients, whether it's families in their own homes or you're going to other locations, what's sort of your personal rule for being absolutely honest and forthright and blunt versus holding back, being careful with people's sensitivities and feelings or you know, not wanting to scare the hell out of them. Well, yeah, look, it's a fine line. I mean, it's like you really have to gauge who you're speaking to, see where they're at. Um, you know, I, I, I really would never want to hurt anybody. And I recognize how I deliver a message can be harmful to somebody psychologically. So I'm very aware of that. Like I have to use my words correctly. I have to show compassion. It's so important. I also say like, and this is what I teach my students, you don't have to tell somebody every single thing that you're seeing. Uh, you have to know what uh, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, how to word it, use discernment. It is so incredibly important. Um, and be nice and be compassionate because people are scared. They don't, and they have this ability and nobody's ever talked to them about it. They're afraid a lot of the time, you know? Um, and even, and I'll say this, this even applies to, dealing with spirits, right? I try to look at spirits as I would look at people. Uh, you got to be careful how we talk to spirits too. have compassion for them. Some of them, maybe we don't think they deserve compassion because of the things that they, they had have done. But uh, I think it's important to kind of look at all sides. Um, but again, I try to show up from a place of love, compassion, uh, understanding, um, and, you know, I recognize too, it's like it, 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 when I'm saying to somebody on the show, like, oh, I think you should move out of your house. I'm like, God, that sounds crazy. Like I'm just told somebody, I think they should move out of their house. And the only time that I would say it is if I, I honestly felt like that was the right thing to say. But again, it's like even saying that, right. That's a hard thing to say to somebody. I don't take that lightly. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. Without calling out, um, outing any specific cases or people, can you think of an example of something that you did hold back on that you maybe saw something or heard something and then you didn't convey it to them because you're like, okay, I, I can work around this specific imagery and still convey the importance. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, without disclosing an episode or a show, I'm just going to leave it wide open. Um, there, there, you know, was an investigation where I saw uh, uh, somebody who was currently alive in the location. Uh, I saw their abuse. I saw all of their abuse. I saw physical, sexual, substance abuse, trauma, uh, all of it. And I was like, okay, what do I do with that? You know, this is real. Like I'm seeing it. And, and how do I, how do I reach this person or talk to this person without uh, re-traumatizing them or triggering them? And that case I'd say was one of the most difficult cases I've ever worked on because there were so many things going on that I just wasn't quite sure how to handle it. Uh, and I, I I really, like, I kind of freaked out. I was like, after it, I was like, I don't know what to do with this. Like, I don't think I can, I can go to this reveal. Like, this is, this is too intense. I don't even know where to begin, you know? And you know what I found, Aaron, is a lot of times people just want to be heard. It's not necessarily about me telling them what I see. It's about me giving them a voice to share their experience and them feeling held in that moment. That is deeply therapeutic. Uh, for somebody just to be able to tell their story and to be looked at with compassion and, 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 you don't, you know, we're not looking at them like they're crazy. That's helpful, you know, but then there's also that space of knowing how to show up to re in a responsible way and to suggest, you know, maybe there, this is a road you should go down maybe, you know, so there are all these different layers and, and it is not easy. Um, at least for me, I mean, there might be some mediums that have no problem just like 
going for the jugular and saying every single thing without discretion. I am not that medium. And so I have been challenged in cases before, especially when it comes to uh, people that are alive that I know have been abused. Um, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, you're still dealing with people and that requires some diplomacy and requires, um, a delicate approach at times. And yeah. And sometimes it just seems like people, as you said, they, they need that voice and they need to be given permission to kind of express what they're going through. Um, it is, yeah, it's, it's it's a balance. For this batch of Dead Files, are there any episodes that, that you can kind of tease that maybe especially shook you or there was some sort of revelation that was especially, like, mind-blowing or one that you're excited for audiences to see? You don't necessarily have to say precisely everything about it, but tease out maybe uh, a location or one of the ones that's coming up well i have to say now that i know what the premiere is the butcher i think uh again i haven't seen seen it but i'll tell you uh it it was i think a really really interesting case um but watch them all they're all different they're all unique i mean it's hard for me to say one is necessarily better than another they all have their own flavor their own you know uh haunting right um I'm trying to think back. I mean, even even the one that we did that aired at the end of Amy's, which I think that that one um, premieres in the UK as as episode one, but it's at the it's at the end of Amy's. I mean, that one was crazy too. Um, there's 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 a lot of interesting ones. I I can't pick one, Aaron. Honestly, I think the butcher though is super interesting. That one that one's crazy. All right, so you're yeah. coming out of the gate strong, and and also outside of all the TV projects, you do have your own filming projects your own passion projects these things are pursuing you touched on indonesia earlier so kind of you know tell share with people a little bit about kind of the grand scheme the things that you want to work on the things that you're doing personally etc yeah look i mean um exploring the world meeting different healers and mediums from different cultures and learning about how how they communicate with spirits has been a a driving force for me for a really long time. Uh, I call it my passion project uh, because I I say like, uh, I'm either going to get this show on air, I'm going to die trying because I'm going to be doing it until I die. Like it is just, it's something that really drives me. It inspires me. Uh, I'm going back to Southeast Asia in October. Uh, I have a couple really cool locations booked that I'm like very excited about. Um, you know, and I've been going to Southeast Asia and into different countries for the better part of 10 years. Um, it's just been a huge part of my life, you know. Um, so that is the one thing uh, I would I would dare to say I, I will always be doing um, it, it in in. I'm doing it for, I want to share it with people, but I'm also doing it for myself. And so it's like, that's the re- really rewarding piece for me too. Um, I teach a lot. I love teaching. Uh, I'd say um, teaching is one of my favorite things to do. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, so I teach a lot of things on Zoom, which has been amazing because people from all over the world come. I've got students from all over the place coming. So people can find it on my website, which is cindykeza.com or on my social media, Cindy Keza. I list all my classes. Um, let's see, I'm touring. Uh, I start to tour more next month into October. Um, I do a lot of live events, oddly at comedy clubs. Don't be confused. I'm not a stand-up comedian. Uh, I'm using the venue uh, to do mediumship, although I will say... Uh, Spirits have a sense of humor, so there are some laughs in there too. Uh, so I want people to know that um, it's been actually pretty liberating working at comedy clubs because I'm like, oh wait, I'm in a comedy club. I can tell a joke from a spirit. Like nobody's going to be offended. This is the venue we're in. Uh, so it's been like a fun way to explore these connections. Like it, it's it's fun. Um, and I yeah. think I'm like, what else? Yeah. I was going to say, like in addition, as I as I opened with the busiest woman in paranormal tv also just busy outside of paranormal tv you're touring a lot you're traveling a lot and these comedy club venues even though you're not there to do stand-up comedy you're in that venue is there a joke that you heard a spirit 
tell you that you could convey is there something like that i mean not really i mean not really i mean it's like like i mean they haven't really said they're funny they're funny like they will tell me like really funny things that i wouldn't say it's a joke but i feel like it's just a little bit more free uh where i can take things almost- but I think one of my favorite ones is like at one time a spirit was like, uh, you know, came through and it was at a comedy club, but it was an event. And the spirit was like, I wouldn't be caught dead here. I'm like, well, you are, <laughs> you know, here you are. <laughs> Joke's on you, buddy. You know, um, but, you know, I, I have a sense of humor. It's not funny, but I mean, laughter is a great medicine. And in the spirit world, the, the people are funny over there. So yeah, I, I love I love working in the spaces. It's been a, it's been awesome. Yeah, I I always feel like while there's certainly times to be serious and times to be very sensitive, it's also I believe kind of folly to approach like any kind of haunted location and just starts assuming everything is going to be quite dour, because I think even in places where maybe sadness occurred, there can still be quite joy and lightness amongst whatever spirit may continue to. to of course. Roam of course and you know Aaron the thing is this like this is where I go really like um I don't know how much time we have left but I I just want to make this point cuz I think it's important um please you know people people wonder like why is this soul stuck at this location you know and it's like that's a really good question because if you read about near death experiences uh there's really no time or space or it's a totally different experience of of those things. Um, It's not linear, right? Uh, There's a book called Dying to Be Me. It was written by this woman, Anita Morjani, and she talks about her near-death experience. Basically, she's able to be in multiple different places at the same time. And she comes back and shares the story, all things fact check, right? And she's dead. So I start thinking about, well, why is this entire soul person I'm stuck at this house I'm like that doesn't make sense energetically to me and then I was like interesting I I I wonder if I'm and this is what I'm believing now I'm starting to believe ask me in 10 years might be a different answer I'm encountering like this fragmented traumatized aspect of a soul that wants to be reintegrated into the oneness that needs healing uh you know people there's a whole thing in psychology today where people that have trauma they they, they, they'll go back and they do what's parts retrieval. They're, they're, they're finding this fragmented piece and they're reincorporating it into their, their being. So they're integrating it into their being for healing. And I'm like, that makes sense to me because, you know, I, I am sure that another aspect of this soul could be communicating with a different medium somewhere else. It could be the little boy of the soul. It could be a different age. And, and, I have to really just kind of look at it that way. And in that space, like, I feel like I can have, I I understand more what my role is uh, as a psychic medium, because it's like when I'm encountering these spirits or these fragmented traumatized aspects of these spirits, uh, it's an opportunity to hopefully help them reintegrate uh, back to the oneness, back to where everything is. Right. Um, And it's all happening simultaneously for whatever that means but it's something to think about um it's something to really think about because it's very hard for me to believe that it's like the entirety of the soul and there's no other aspect somewhere else um but for the sake of television it's kind of wordy to be like well i'm in this house and i'm you know interacting with this fragmented version of this spirit you know it's like you it's maybe i could but uh i just uh I don't know. I think about these things a lot, you know? I like that a lot because it also just goes to, it kind of speaks to the point that even though you're doing this and you've done this a lot, we're still all literally and figuratively poking around the dark trying to figure out what's going on. And we have theories, we have ideas, but not necessarily rules about what all and and asking questions and continuing to ask questions. That is part of the the journey as well. Seems like for mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, of course it's like, a, it's, I'm, I, I am a forever student of mediumship of life of all of these things, because I, I believe that the second you think, you know, everything is the second that you, you do yourself a disservice and, and limit yourself to all of the possibilities 
So I am like open. I'm open to all of it. Uh, I, I'm curious. Uh, curiosity is a beautiful place. Um, so everybody be curious. Just be curious. It's fun. If you allow yeah. yourself to be curious, it's like an amazing space to live in. All right. Well, on that note, on the very uh, great uh, closing note, I will say that my guest is Cindy Keza, and we have the new episodes of The Dead Files returning Thursday, September 7th at 10 p.m. on Eastern Time on Travel Channel, and I believe same day on the Max streaming service. And Cindy, just thanks so much for joining me and um, giving me such great insight and uh, finally making this happen. We're, I'm glad we got it. I know. We're both yeah. in Brooklyn and we're on Zoom. What is this shit, Aaron? Uh, I know it's it's very strange, but hopefully I get to see this person <laughs> soon. I could literally walk to your place in like seven minutes, I think. I know, I know. <laughs> it's very peculiar, but uh, we need to meet soon, grab some coffee and hang out. Totally. I would love it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Cindy. And I'm Aaron Sagers, and this has been Talking Strange. Until next time, be kind, stay spooky, and keep it weird. <laughs>